Hi guys, uh, welcome back to the channel. Um, today we're going to do a, a, a video on uh, what I call the unlamest Christian poet, George Herbert. Uh, George Herbert was a poet who lived uh, just just uh, just after the time of Shakespeare and roughly a contemporary of, uh, of Milton. So he's born in 1593 and died uh, 39 years later in 1633. Um, now, what do I mean by lame, a lame Christian poet? If he's the unlamest Christian poet, what's a lame Christian poet? Well, I think most of us would recognize that as with lame Christian music, uh, there's lame Christian poetry. And let me start by m maybe showing the best of what we might call the lame Christian poet poetry. Uh, so the best of the worst. And it's, uh, well, I, I guess with everything, the quality of, of the quality uh, is always very much in a pyramid, isn't it? That the very best are the very, uh, are the rarest, right? There's only one Shakespeare type thing. So Christian poetry doesn't lack enthusiasm, just like Christian, uh, Christian music doesn't lack enthusiasm, but there's something in it, something endemic to it that, um, you know, really causes, causes problems in terms of quality. And I think one of the big things is the laziness or the, the, the limitations inherent in Christian doctrine around rhyming. So like I say, the best of the worst, let's take John Newton's 1779, uh, very well-known song, Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, a saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Twas blind, but now I see. Um, even in those few few lines there, you can see what problems already emerging is the limited lime uh, rhyming possibilities. You know, um, Christians want to rhyme V with C, um, grace with face, believe with relieve. There's only so, you know, doc, Christian doctrine has a very controlling tendency on, uh, on rhyme. And rhyme, unfortunately, has a very prompt prominent place in English language poetry um, more than it should have. Anyway, we'll talk about rhyme some other time in, uh, sorry, that was an unintentional rhyme. We'll talk about rhyme another time uh, when we're talking about poetry, maybe do a whole separate video on it. Um, so, so there you have it. So I'd say that the problems with Christian poetry is, is the repetitious rhyming. That's the biggest problem. Um, and it's excessively optimistic. Um, it's, it's excessively optimistic. There's something intrinsically optimistic about Christianity, uh, Christ's conquest of death and suffering, that every eye shall be dried, every tear dried, you know, and all will be happy in the kingdom of God, because this is the veil of tears and kingdom of God will be a happy place. Um, that tends to make in my opinion, Christian poetry excessively optimistic, uh, it's pietistic, and it's too declarative. What do I mean by declarative? I mean the tendency of um, Christian songs, prayers, and poetry uh, to be instructive. Um, the primary purpose of poetry is an instruction. It's uh, suppose it's inspiration, it's uh, entertainment, it's, um, it's pleasure, it's not instruction. That's my theory. If you don't like it, let's have a debate in the comments. Um, and my, the my thinking isn't, of course, exhausted on these matters anyway. These are just some of the things that I've been thinking about. So it's, it's intrinsically declarative too. So there's a doctrine that needs to be explained. Um, and Christian poetry and music and prayer have always been that way. Um, I mean, even look at the Our Father. The Our Father is instructive too. Um, Our Father, which art in heaven. Yeah, don't we all know that the Father is in heaven? 
uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Um, for thine is the kingdom, right? We know all this stuff, but it's, well, at least, you know, somebody who knows their faith knows all this stuff. But Christian poetry and song and prayer has always had that pedagogical function, um, which is useful for the purposes of the church, which is the instruction of, of the faithful, but it doesn't necessarily lend to good poetry. And this was, I mean, there's a certain amount that you can say that even the great poems of the Christian tradition, the Divine Comedy of Dante and Milton's Paradise Lost and Regained, they are perhaps limited by that doctrinal function they have to explain the faith, to teach the faith, to, to correct um, what they would consider uh, false interpretations of the faith. So we can even see that in Paradise um, Regained where Milton belabors uh, certain criticism of Catholicism, for instance. Um, and Dante corrects, you know, challenges various political and theological points in the Divine Comedy. Um, and, I mean, this dates way back to the beginnings of Christianity. Uh, with Augustine, he wrote um, songs and poems for instructive purposes. Uh, so does St. Ambrose. Um, and it, it may, again, it's, it's a good churchy function, but it doesn't make it good art. Um, so I think the two kind of, in a way, are, are, they're not necessarily opposed goals, but they're not the same thing. Instruction and um, the goals of art, which are to, um, to present beauty, they're different goals. They're not necessarily hostile, but to integrate two goals is way harder than to uh, pursue just one goal. So that's why Christian poetry is intrinsically or has a, has a very hard battle uh, with not being lame. So in my survey of Christianity, my survey of Christian poetry, I would say that so far anyway, the winner uh, for the non-lame award is this guy, George Herbert. So George Herbert, again, he's 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 well known but he's not you know he's like a tiny pebble in between uh the giant boulders of shakespeare uh and milton for instance um in you know okay so let's go back to herbert for a second and and just talk a little bit about him so again he was uh a, basically a baby when shakespeare was doing his thing um and uh so he's, he spent most of his short professional life, as I said, he was 39 when he died, uh, as a clergyman for the Church of England. Um, before that, he had a short stint as a pub, as public orator of Cambridge University, and he actually spent a year or two in Parliament. Um, so he was, he was, uh, he had a pretty successful um, career, even though short, and the fact that he basically chose uh, a very uh, simple life as a uh, as a pastor in a small church um, is really credit to his character. Um, he could have certainly continued in the circles of the great at Cambridge and in court circles and so on and stayed on in Parliament uh, and and uh, as as many did. I mean, you know, Ben Johnson, uh, his rough contemporary, was uh, in those courtly circles and so on. Um, so, uh, again, his, his life was rather short and most of his poetry were, was published in a, in a volume called, or entitled the temple. So his book of poetry is called the temple. Um, now he's classified as one of the so-called metaphysical poets. And this comes, th this, this term metaphysical poet, um, was coined by Samuel Johnson and basically it's it's a very vague term and it's not one highly favored these days uh, but it includes such people as uh, john dunn and crowley for instance um, so some some well-known poets um, and i think the metaphysical side of things does hint i think to 
something I was saying about the instructive dimension of the the instructed instructive dimension of Christian poetry, the 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 inherent uh, tendency it has to want to teach, um, take it or leave it. Um, now, I call him a Christian poet, and there are not many people that I would qualify as Christian poets. Lots of poets who are Christian, and lots of Christians who are poets. But uh, I'm going to call, for the purposes of this, I'm going to call uh, him a Christian poet, because basically all his poems are Christian-themed. Okay? Now, many other people fit into this category as well. Well, not many others. Of course, Milton does. Many of his poems were explicitly Christian. Um, and then other poets are obviously Christian, and there's Christian themes in their poetry, like Shakespeare's a Christian poet in a certain sense, but I think it would be better to call Shakespeare a poet who is a Christian, or a Christian who is a poet, because his, his religion doesn't really come out overtly and predominantly in his poetry. <clears throat> If you take someone like uh, John Donne, whom I mentioned already, um, Dunn's, the second half of Dunn's poetry is very heavily Christian, explicitly Christian, but his earlier stuff isn't. Um, and then other poets like Coleridge, uh, Wordsworth, um, and Pope, Alexander Pope, the, they're, they're again, they're about like, um, they're like Dunn. Basically half their stuff is Christian. Um, and uh, a few others fit into that category as well, but those would be some of the most accomplished and well-known. Uh, so there's an argument that Coleridge and Wordsworth and Pope are Christian poets, but I don't think they survive this criteria. So far, only Milton does, and of course, the subject of our of our video, George Herbert. <clears throat> so, and then other poets, of course, uh, like Keats, Shire, uh, Byron, and Shelley were atheistic um, and overtly so. Shelley got into some trouble for it. Uh, Keats was just far too young for it to be of much of a consequence and Byron was, you know, um, quite famously uh, a bit of a, <laughs> I don't know what you would call it, a um, bit of an Epicurean. Um, so anyway, in the end I think George Herbert fits the bill best as Christian poet. Um, and again, I, I reserve uh, Milton to that as well. And I'll discuss, I'll compare Herbert and Milton at the very end of this, uh, of this video. Now, the other thing is, of course, so I'm talking about the unlamest, or in other words, say the best. So who's the best Christian poet? So Christian poet uh, and all these qualifiers um, make for a smaller and smaller group. And... I say in the end, uh, very few people can be called poets, Christian poets, great Christian poets, great greatest Christian poet. Uh, and I think George Herbert fits the bill best. Um, let me give an example uh, so to, to my way of thinking um, by comparing it to uh, novelists. Um, what novelists are Christian? What, what number of novelists are Christian novelists? Um, and there's the same problem there, of course, is that does Christianity lend itself to good novel writing or to bad novel writing, or it's, it has no uh, influence, no impact at all on whether the art is good or, or poor. Um, there, I, I want to talk about two, two, two writers that I would call Christian novelists. I want to talk about Dostoevsky and Flannery O'Connor. So Dostoevsky was obviously a Russian uh, novelist from 1821 to 1881, and Flannery O'Connor was a uh, American Catholic. Dostoevsky was a member of the Russian Orthodox Church, and Flannery, Flannery O'Connor was an American Catholic in the American South, and she was born in 1925 to 1964. She died. Um, so if you know these works, if you know the works of Dostoevsky and Flannery O'Connor, and many do, whether you know them well or not, it's another question, I think they do well to exemplify the problem of Christian novelist. Um, 
Dostoevsky's works, the vast majority of them, um, are very clear and fruitful uh, products of a Christian, a genius Christian novelist. Um, Brother Kar Brothers Karamazov might perhaps be the best of what I would call a Christian novel. Um, you could you can also make the argument if you prefer Crime and Punishment. Um, Crime and Punishment is less explicitly Christian, but I think the the same basic problem uh, that Dostoevsky is dealing with, so the problem of conscience, the necessity of belief in God, I think that that is the underlying theme in Crime and Punishment, as it is more explicitly in terms of uh, Brothers Karamazov. Um, and other ones of his works, like The Underground Man, um, it's the same writer, the same ideas, the same philosophical quandaries. Uh, Underground Man um, is often integrated, incorporated in uh, courses on uh, ph uh, philosophy department courses on existentialism. Uh, and The Underground Man is, well, let's put it this way, if crime and punishment is Christian, then Underground Man is Christian. And I, and I would argue that they all are because it's the same basic universe that, that Dostoevsky's created. Um, same intellectual artistic universe. So if Brothers Karamazov is Christian, then they're all Christian. Now Flannery O'Connor is another very successful, uh, in my opinion. Uh, I don't mean the word successful to mean um, uh, monetarily successful. I mean uh, artistically successful. Um, Flannery O'Connor's uh, most well-known uh, work, uh, it's a short story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, is a wonderful example of successful Christian, uh, well in this case it's not a novel, it's a short story, of Christian narration. Um, and if you know the, the book or the short story, then wonderful. Uh, her novel Wise Blood is another more obvious Christian-themed book. It's not about Catholics, but about basically this guy who creates his own religion, uh, his own version of Christianity. And other short stories like her uh, Good Country People, for instance, are wonderful, uh, wonderful artistic attempts to deal with the problem of integrating life and Christian doctrine. So, I mean, I could, I could phrase that and rephrase that in different ways, but how does the Christian doctrine or the Christian belief um, or the problem of belief in God, the problem of faith, how, how do these things um, impact uh, human life? And can, can the author um, make good art out of their interaction? Okay, so that's my definition of, of Christian, of, a, of Christian art or Christian fictional art in this case. Um, how, how, what is the interplay like between Christian doctrine and human life? Okay, now taking that, taking that uh, definition or, or that question and applying it to the works of George Herbert, this is why he rises up and to his status of greatness, I would say. Um, I'm going to quote a few of his poems, hopefully not too long to make, you know, to make this too long. I'll, 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 in, I'll put all the text and more than, than I'm going to read out. I'll put it on the video here for you to read yourself, uh, and you can pause it if you need to. Um, but this is my essential point, is the success with which Herbert integrates human life, so human experience, and Christian doctrine, the interplay between the two, the artistic interplay he, he's able to bring about between the two. So this is from his poem, Affliction, Affliction One. Uh, he must have had obviously more than one uh, poem entitled Affliction. What pleasures could I want, whose king I served, where joys my fellows were? Thus argued into hopes, my thoughts reserved, no place for grief or fear. Therefore my sudden soul caught at the place, and made her youth and fierceness seek thy face. At first thou givest me milk, gavest me milk and sweetnesses, I had my wish and way, 
My days were strawed with flowers and happiness. There was no month but May. But with my years, sorrow did twist and grow, and made a party unawares of woe. My flesh began unto my soul in pain. Sicknesses cleave my bones, consuming argues, argues, consuming agues dwell in every vein, and tune my breath to groans. Sorrow was all my soul, I scarce believed, till grief did tell me roundly that I lived. When I got health, thou tookest away my life, and more for my friends die. My mirth and edge was lost, a blunted knife was of more use than I. Thus thin and lean, without a fence or friend, I was blown through with every storm and wind. Whereas my birth and spirit rather took the way that takes the town, thou didst betray me to a lingering book and wrap me in a gown. I was entangled in the world of strife before I had the power to change my life. Um, again, that's just part of that poem, and it's, oh, I think it's it's wonderful in its honesty and its in its um, insistence on dwelling upon the darkness of life as well, and not just of the, the victory of Christ. Um, one of his more famous poems is entitled Easter Wings, and one of the things about this poem, which you'll see, is that it's uh, it's written in, in a form of like um, the sweeping form of of bird's wings I would say that that's what the shape is trying to get but if you look at it it's written in this um, almost it's a, in this chiastic structure uh, and in fact in fact the the contents of the line uh, sort of are a play on um, the essential uh, Christian theme of greatness and humility um, so if you look at it the, the the abundance is on the longer lines and in the, in the misery and the lack is on the thinner lines okay so let's look at that Easter wings Lord who created man and wealth and store though foolishly he lost the same decaying more and more till he became most poor with thee oh let me rise as larks harmoniously and sing this day victories then shall the fall further the flight in me so you have that you have that falling structure and then rising structure and then again in the second stanza my tender age and sorrow did begin and still with sicknesses and shame thou didst so punish sin that i became most thine with thee let me combine and feel thy victory for if i imp my wing on thine affliction shall advance the flight in me so we have that falling action and then the rising action again and that's a wonderful a beautiful poem not just for the structure but uh, the contents as well <clears throat> uh, the next poem denial uh, when my devotions could not pierce thy silent ears then was my heart broken as was my verse my breast was full of fears and disorder my bent thoughts, like a brittle bow, did fly asunder. Each took his way, some would to pleasures go, some to the wars and thunder of alarms. As good go anywhere, they say, as to be numb, both knees and heart, in crying night and day, come, come, my God, O oh come, but no hearing. Oh, that thou shouldest give dust a tongue to cry to thee, and then not hear it crying all day long, my heart was in my knee, but no hearing. Therefore my soul lay out of sight, untuned, unstrung. My feeble spirit, unable to look right, like a nip blossom hung, discontented. O oh, cheer and tune my heartless breast, defer no time, so that thy favors granting my request, they and my mind may chime and mend my rhyme. What I like about that poem especially is that there's no solution offered. There's just a word of hope, right? It doesn't say, oh, then God answered all my problems. And that's the kind of, that's the, that's the, that's, that's the sort of un immature, unreflective interpretation that we can um, draw from St. Augustine's Confessions. On, on a surface view, it looks like Augustine had a bunch of problems in life 
then he discovered God and the Christian Catholic religion, and then all his problems went away. That's not what the story says if you read beyond in chapters 10, 11, 12, and 13. Um, it, it gives a theology that's different from, from that, what it's easy to conclude from in the first nine books. And so much of Christian poetry and song is like that. I used to have problems, now I don't have problems because of God. Um, George Herbert doesn't write like that, and that was very clear in that poem uh, that I just read there. Um, denial. And I think that that characterizes a lot of his poetry. I'm not going to read too many, too many more, maybe just one more. This is called Redemption. Having been tenant long to a rich lord, not thriving, I resolved to be bold and make a suit unto him to afford a new small rented lease in cancelled dold. In heaven at his manor, in him I, I him sought. They told me there he was lately gone, about some land which he had dearly bought, long since on earth to take possession. I straight returned, and knowing his great birth, sought him according, excordingly in great resorts, in cities, theatres, gardens, parks, and courts. At length I heard a ragged noise and mirth of thieves and murderers. Here I him espied, who straight your suit is granted, said, and died. That's wonderful. Um, there's, uh, there's more poems here that I'd love to, to read to you, um, but they show that those similar structures, not only is he a great poet in terms of his word choice, in terms of his balance, in terms of his structure of his lines, in terms of his rhyme, uh, not only is he great in that way, he's great as a, a student of human nature reflecting on the implications of his religion for his life. And it's really quite admirable. Um, his view isn't isn't optimistic, uh, or at least not excessively so. And that's something I, I really appreciate, and that wins wins me over to him. Now, oh, and one thing that I should say as well is that when you're reading these poems, or at least when I am, um, I really think a lot about scripture. His his poetry is very much is very reminiscent of things like the book of Job, uh, different Psalms, uh, book of Lamentations, um, <clears throat> uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and different of the prophets, um, and Ecclesiastes. So think I think mainly about Job and Ecclesiastes then how the honesty and beauty of Job is precisely because it's not excessively optimistic. It doesn't sugarcoat the struggles of human life to magnify God, right? That God makes your life easy and that uh, that's why we should be Christians and that good Christian poetry can convey that. I don't believe that and I don't believe that that's uh, an accurate uh, teaching of what Christianity is meant to meant to convey. Um, I think that we, you know, it's essential to Christian doctrine, the doctrine of original sin, and the fact that this life is a veil of tears, right? Um, that we, there is crying here, and that uh, we go out, you know, with tears, um, and then we come back uh, reaping in joy. Um, so I think if you read, uh, I recommend reading George Herbert because of his uh, poetic and his theological uh, magnificence. Now, let me end then on Milton, a comparison with John Milton. So I call George Herbert the great Christian poet, but the fact is I just said John Milton was a greater poet. Um, he's a greater poet. It doesn't make him a greater Christian poet. You know, insofar as he's a Christian, um, what's the spirit of their writings? What's the spirit of their message? What's the spirit of their theology? Uh, as I said, Herbert deals more with the human condition uh, in an existential sense, rather than if we compare his poetry to, say, for instance, po uh, Paradise, Paradise Lost and Regained. Um, 
there's a consideration of the human condition very thoroughly in those poems, but it's a doctrinal rather than a um, existential consideration. And I'd say the same with Dante to a certain extent. Um, not La Vita Nuova, which is very existential, but in the Divine Comedy, it's a doctrinal consideration and you have less of the human coming across. Um, so I, I, I would define Milton as an historical, a doctrinal, and a pedagogical Christian poet, where Herbert offers more like short prayers, um, short considerations uh, that are more to the modern taste anyway. Um, we're not as open to a lengthy consideration of human life as is found in Paradise Lost, for instance, than we are to, you know, a 10 or 15 line poem by Herbert. So I think it's very much to our modern tastes and so on as well. So there is my, uh, I guess, sales pitch for George Herbert. And uh, I can only hope that you will read his poems and um, find them as enjoyable as me. And if you don't, um, I want to hear about it. I want to hear about why you don't like him uh, or why, for instance, you think uh, Wordsworth or whomever is a way better Christian poet or Dunn or somebody. So anyway, thanks for watching, guys. Um, this is my first uh, uh, use of the camera with... Uh, my new uh, editing software so you know we'll see what happens and uh, thanks very much I appreciate it